Hey everyone, you are listening to the Divergent Conversations podcast. We are two neurodivergent mental health professionals in a neurotypical world. I'm Patrick Cassell. And I'm Dr. Neff. And during these episodes, we do talk about sensitive subjects, mental health, and there are some conversations that can certainly feel a bit overwhelming. So we do just want to use that disclosure and disclaimer before jumping in. And thanks for listening. If you're looking to grow your business and get in front of a new audience, Divergent Conversations is accepting new sponsors for the 2024 seasons. We already have over 300,000 downloads and counting all over the world. And this podcast is growing all of the time. The beauty of podcast sponsorship is that you can get live pre-roll or mid-roll opportunities where we will read your ad on air while recording, getting you in front of a new audience every single week. You have the opportunity to sponsor one month of episodes at a time where you'll get four episodes in total, or you can sponsor an entire year and be the exclusive sponsor of Divergent Conversations. This is a podcast that's being distributed all over the world. The analytics are fantastic. The podcast is growing and it is a very captive audience. Reach out to us directly via the link in our website at divergentpod.com or email us at divergentconversationspodcast at gmail.com and we can get started on your sponsorship journey. So, Patrick, today we're talking about sensory shutdown and meltdown. And partly, uh, first of all, you te- you texted me last week. You're like, we should do an episode on this. And my first thought was like, oh my gosh, how have we not done an episode on shutdown and meltdown yet? Um, but I'm curious what prompted you. Like, was it after a shutdown that you're like, let's do a podcast on this? You know, that's how our lives work. And like, we have these ideas, right? Because we listed out a ton of topics when we first have the idea to launch this podcast and then when we meet or the day that we're going to meet we text each other and we're like hey you want to talk about this and it could be completely different than what we were going to talk about i think that's what makes this so fun is like the ability to just diverge and create but yeah i think i was thinking about it because we hadn't done it we get a lot of dms to our instagram um that ask specifically for an episode on this topic, um, strategies, tips, how it shows up, et cetera. Um, but I, I typically have a lot of shutdown moments in my life. So it just was feeling kind of front and center. Yeah. Well, and we were in the holiday season and I think holiday season is a huge sensory shutdown, meltdown territory. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Should we define shutdown and meltdown first? Okay. So yeah, sensory, uh, people are probably a little bit more familiar with sensory meltdown. It's more talked about, but, um, and I like to link this to nervous system states. I find that helpful. When we're in that sensory meltdown, we're often in that more of that um, fight flight energy. And so it's, it's pretty visible to the people around us. And so it's one where we've just, it's like our brain. Well, it's kind of like our brain is melting from all the sensory overload. And then I, like, I know for me, um, like I actually just had a sensory meltdown, which is, I haven't had one in years, Patrick, but I, I had one last week. Um, what was going on? Well, we got a new puppy, so I haven't been sleeping well. And then I forgot how overstimulating puppies are. Um, and he, he has this really loud, high pitched bark. Our, we have another, have a niece who's three. And he, he doesn't have that kind of, he doesn't bark very much. Um, and so I hadn't slept well. Um, the puppy was being overstimulated. I was trying to like manage the puppy, but then upload something to WordPress, which is a platform I do not understand. And my, I use Squarespace for my website, but it's a partnership and I was really frustrated at myself that I, I, the person I'm collaborating with had done a walkthrough with me to show me how to upload this stuff, but it was like a month ago and like nothing was working. And you've seen my desktop. I was like trying to find the file and I couldn't even find the file I was trying to upload. So it was like this series of fatigue, sensory overwhelm. I was having a really bad health day and it was just like too much. 
and I um so I've I the way I describe it like I feel like I want to lash out which is again very not normal for me um and at times it's looked like lashing out at myself um in adolescence I think I was having a lot of meltdowns and that's what led to a lot of my self-harm so this, there's this like very kind of aggressive needing to lash out. And I see that as like needing to get the energy out is what it feels right. like. Um, so I'm so not proud of this, but I, I'm going to say this because a lot of people, a lot of autistic people have a lot of shame around their meltdown. So I'm going to, I'll be really transparent here. In that moment, my my husband was in the room and I was like, this was a terrible idea. I think we should give this puppy back. I I knew when I said it, there was no way we're like rehoming this puppy or sure. like I like that would crush the kids. It would like that doesn't feel ethical to me. And like Total. I knew it wasn't true, but I said it. And I think what I was saying in that moment is like, it's too much. And then I did. I was like, it's too yeah. much. It's too much. And I started to cry and I went upstairs and I um, I put the dogs in their crate and they napped and I napped and then. I was tired for the rest of the day, but it was better. Um, yeah, so the, like I feel the cortisol when I'm in a meltdown and it feels I'm someone who ha who typically has a lot of control over myself. And so these moments when it feels like I have less control are really disarming. They're really scary. Um, yeah, so so that would be a sensory meltdown i realized I, I diverged from like explanation to personal experience before i explain shutdown do you want to add anything about meltdowns or your experience of them yeah one i wanted to say like one thanks for naming that i know that's an inside look into what was happening and i know that was a lot it sounds like to me like when you hit that moment right and, and this is just my own experience with any sort of sensory meltdown when you said i want to give this dog back or whatever you were just at your limit. You were just like mm -hmm. so overwhelmed and so frustrated and so, so worn down that that was the only way to express those emotions that you were experiencing. And then once you, once you say it out loud, you're just kind of like, yeah, obviously we're not going to do that. And I'm still really overwhelmed. And I find for me, the best answer all the time is that quiet, dark, like I need to sleep. I need to lay down. I just need to be in that state where I can just like melt into the bed and not have to have any responsibilities. Mm -hmm. But I'm definitely, I will be honest, as I'm watching my two dogs circle each other for a treat that one of them is eating, one of them has created that sensation for me so many times because he's tiny. He's, he has that like high pitch bark. He barks at everything. He's, he is a lot. And I had lived with my dad. For about two months down in Florida, two years ago, I had brought both dogs and my dad's house is 900 square feet, two beds, one bathroom. It was hot. It's humid. It's Florida. Everything that could happen that led to like these meltdowns, these sensory meltdowns was happening where our Shih Tzu fur, he, he was getting like these sticky sapling things in his fur outside in my dad's yard. And I was having to like pull them out and there were so many of them and he was in pain. And then I'm in my dad's house and the dog is barking at everything, whether it's the, the window, some noise, something that moved and my dad is getting frustrated. And I'm like, okay, how do I handle this? And then I was like scared to leave my dad's house because I didn't want my dog to just be barking okay. and then my dad to have to deal with it. So it was becoming a situation where I was literally having these sensory meltdowns on almost multiple times a day. <laughs> and. I was almost, it felt like I was at my wit's end. It felt like I'd really, mm -hmm. like you said, mm -hmm. cortisol is ramping up. I also consider myself someone who's pretty in control of how I experience my emotions a lot of the time or how I at least put them into the world. And I was just getting very short, very frustrated, like no longer could function, right? Even the littlest of tasks become the biggest of tasks and they become almost impossible because my executive function is just out the window. It's just not existing. I'm like, I can't even think straight right now. And it becomes a situation where like, I feel so shameful and so defeated and so overwhelmed and I want to cry and never cry. So it probably would be helpful at those moments. And I just feel lost. Like I don't know what to do and they do pass. But in those moments, 
they're really painful and they can they're feel terrible kind of embarrassing yeah they're yeah they're so painful and they're so embarrassing like i felt like like the other night, i felt like a child tantruming and like i'm a 39 year old woman <laughs> or human um i don't like thinking of myself as a woman that's another story but 39 year old human um who like yeah it, it's so embarrassing and i and i hear that a lot from people that that that's one of the hardest things about a meltdown is afterwards like the embarrassment and the shame um and also like it they can do a lot of relational damage right like i was talking sure. about my dog and i was able to circle back to my spouse and be like i didn't actually mean that i knew i didn't mean it here here's what was happening but like there's scenarios where, you know, maybe that comment, I want to get rid of this puppy, maybe for some people it's, I want a divorce or I want to like, you know, be, be if it's coming out at another person. Um, I think in meltdowns, we, we can say some really harmful things out of that. It's too much yeah. energy. And I think that gets really complicated. Um, and Again, we're we're acting very incongruent from our values and meltdowns for a lot of the time, and I th and so I, naturally we're going to experience a lot of shame in the aftermath of that. And I think one thing you just mentioned that I think is important is you said I'm, I'm a 39 year old person, but I feel like a child. But in those moments, there is a lot of inner child happening, and there's a lot of inner child stuff going on. Where I think we can all think back to when we were kids when we weren't attuned to, when we weren't attended to, when we weren't co-regulated with, when we weren't supported in any capacity or unseen, whatever. And you act out, I feel like I have to get my point across. I have to be able to express myself. And as adults, we learn, we keep that contained. Like we regulate ourselves. We don't, we don't let those emotions come out in a way. And it's almost like this volcano, right? Like it's like bubbling, 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 all of a sudden eruption. And then all of a sudden can't think straight, can't see straight may say things I may regret, like you said, and have significant damage in relationships, um, can come across in ways that you don't intend to. Um, and then you immediately go into that shame spiral of like, what did I just do? What did I just say? How did I just react? That was so embarrassing of me. I didn't have control over mm -hmm. myself. And we all, I mean, you know, it was, we, we center so much in this podcast on autistic experience as autistic folks. We want to have control over ourselves and we, mm -hmm. we like control. And when we are out of control, it feels like we are out of regulation. And like you said, congruency with our colors. Mm -hmm. so. so, okay. I like don't even want to go there, but because I, I don't have an answer, but I want to name it as attention. And this is not where I saw this podcast going, but um, okay. Here's the tension I feel of this idea of like, we don't have control in a meltdown. And that's actually been really helpful also in my parenting of understanding like my, if one of my children has a meltdown, like they're not trying to be hurtful. This is not something that they have a lot of control over or, and again, I, I'm not sure is, is it that we have no control? Is it that we don't have much control? Like I, I don't know categorically, sure. but then this idea of like accountability. So let's say we do have a meltdown and we say something painful and but and we also understand we had less control over what we were saying or we we're doing or if we do something painful like what does it look like to repair relationally after that what how much accountability should we be having for those moments like these are things and then on the this is again something that when it's talked about it's it's talked about um with a lot of like hushness and and quietness and shame but like you know there's a lot of parents out there specifically who who are wondering what do I do when my adolescent has a meltdown and they become aggressive like toward a sibling or toward me like this is really hard territory we're talking about yeah 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 very 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 hard uh, from that perspective, like what do I do as my loved one is becoming aggressive in public? What do I do? Mm -hmm. You know, and let's say if I'm thinking about my nieces and nephews who are young black kids in the South, what if that happens in public? There's so many safety risks there in mm -hmm. general. Um, then again, once I want to circle back to your 
mention of control. Like, is it no control? Is it limited control? Are we just in a state where it's hard to access that ability to bring it in? I don't know. But I know that there are often ruptures that need to be repaired. And when you mentioned accountability, that's huge, right? Like if I was having a meltdown with my wife, I will often fall into that shame aspect. Um, I shouldn't have acted like that. I shouldn't have reacted about like that. And it takes time for me to regulate and ground and soothe. And then I oftentimes will say to her, hey, this is what was happening. And I'm really sorry that I reacted like that. And she'll always say, I don't. And I'm like, well, I guess thank you for understanding. But again, I still want to name that and take accountability over that. So that has just come with a lot of these experiences happening and having to really sit with, do I feel like I should be accountable to what just happened? Sometimes it's external, right? Where it's like, I don't even have, I don't, I'm not bringing this on to myself. Um, and that's for a parenting piece. I can't speak to that, obviously, but like, I imagine that would be so unbelievably challenging and, and really difficult to figure out what do I do in a situation if my adolescent is, is reacting in this way? Mm -hmm. How do I protect them? How do I protect myself? How do I protect their siblings, friends, et cetera? It's, it's really complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is one of those areas that I like I can think of myself in knots over really easily. Um yeah. and like the the go-to advice, right, is to do things that reduce the meltdown from happening in the first place, right? So right. to reduce and just to develop a sensory lens, which I talk about all the time, especially for parents. It's like, okay, think through the sensory context of that. Is there anything that could have been done differently? Um, it's interesting for me, I'm thinking back to that, like, and I haven't felt like that since I was a parent of young children. And it's, for me, it's really tied to sleep deprivation, plus like a sensory overwhelming yeah. environment, like the combination of that, that's like, I would say pretty much the only times I have meltdowns. Otherwise I have shutdowns. Um, and oh. I have so many shutdowns. That's like my default, which we will talk about, but if I could go back, so there's this idea of like behavior chaining in therapy where it's like, okay, after whether it's an emotional meltdown or like a sensory meltdown, you go back and you like, because it in the moment, it feels like things go from zero to a hundred, but actually they're going a little bit slower. So you dissect it second by second. At what point was there an exit ramp? So for me, if I go back to this last weekend, when I had a puppy that was yipping next to me and I was trying to do something complex technology and with executive functioning like at some point if I could have accessed my narrator it would have been like okay you're not going to get this thing uploaded I know you really want to because you want to get something off your to-do list today um let's pivot or let's like let's ask your spouse to take the dog and you can go focus um but there would have like looking back, I can see like, okay, there was an exit ramp there that I, that I didn't take. Um, and, and I know it would have been harder for me to take cause I was already, I was not in a great space. Um, but that sort of reflection for me has been really helpful to like dissect the experience and to identify what were the exit ramps I could have taken. Cause in doing right. that, it means I'm more likely next time to see the exit ramps and be like, Oh, this is where like, this is not working. I need to take this exit room. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I like that uh, strategy um, because that also those exit ramps kind of reframe the, the control piece that we just talked about. Like, mm -hmm. do I have control if there are exit ramps available that we can become more aware of? Then there is more of a, a likelihood that you have control to make that decision uh, to step away to remove yourself to to ask for support, et cetera. So I think that's a really great exercise. Ooh, and now let's overlay it with attachment theory. I just had this thought. Okay, so let's say you're partnered and let's say you're with a partner who has a more anxious attachment. Um, conflict can be like just the emotions of that. That can be really sensory overwhelming. So I could imagine there's a point in conflict where the autistic person needs an exit ramp if they're not gonna have a sensory meltdown. And I would say a sensory meltdown in middle of conflict is a really bad idea. You're like, you're going to say painful, hurtful things that yeah. you will later feel terrible about and that you probably don't mean. Um, 
But the anxiously attached partner might have a really hard time letting the autistic pe- person take that exit ramp. And so like, again, having like a pregame, I don't know why I'm doing so much. I'm doing weird metaphors today. <laughs> a pregame <laughs> like plan of when I hit my limit, I, I need to take space away. And I, and that like, I, I need a word I can say that you know that I actually, I have to, I'm coming back, but I have to take a step away. Um, because I think... Yeah, that's one dynamic I could see getting really tricky. Absolutely. That's, that's a great point. So having that that code word or phrase or just having a conversation as like a blueprint of if this is what's happening, here's an internal like glimpse into my my reality. I always find that can be useful to say like, this is what's happening. It has nothing to do with you. I need to step away so I can circle back so we can have a conversation that doesn't, you know, um, rupture that doesn't need to be repaired. Easier said than done, but mm-hmm. certainly a thing that can be done. I'm thinking of a, a specific sensory meltdown experience and you just did an episode on reflecting on the new year. Last year, right after throat surgery in New Orleans, first retreat of the year, January, so two months after throat surgery, definitely not ready to be working in that capacity by any means. I just remember being in the kitchen, 25 other people, no one's doing anything wrong. Everyone's talking, socializing, et cetera my executive functioning really starts to diminish. My sensory system really starts to struggle. Everything becomes amplified. So someone Mm -hmm. opening the refrigerator, the lights become brighter, noises become uh, louder. All of a sudden I'm like, holy shit, what is happening? And all of a sudden I had to literally remove myself, go outside, scream at the top of my lungs in the middle of fucking New Orleans. People were probably like, what the hell? Well, it was New Orleans, so that probably was not uncommon release it. So I felt so embarrassed because I'm like, I'm an adult human being, like hosting this event. And I just had to do that to regulate myself, to be able to be a part of this event. It was very challenging, brought up a lot of shit. Don't want to diverge too much. But these things can really take over and they can be mm-hmm. really destructive and they can be really damaging internally. This, mm-hmm. this shame spiral is really, really hard when that comes over you. So hard. So hard. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. First of all, being in a kitchen with 25 people, like I could never. <laughs> um, it's like, yeah, that would be so hard to be like, I am in, I am like in charge of all of these people, making sure they have a good experience. And then I've got to go like release this energy through like a human yell. Like, oh my gosh, Patrick, that sounds so painful. And then, yeah, that was not yeah. fun. So that was a good moment to uh, reflect on. Um, but again, like you said, exit ramps, being able to remove myself and knowing that I needed to remove myself and not mm-hmm. just enduring and not just sitting there and being like, you're going to white knuckle and you're going to power through this because that's not how that works. And It's not. It needs to be released. I love your word release. It needs to be burned off. It's There's tons of cortisol going through your body. You've got to release it. And, I, and having... Helpful. That's another like plan ahead thing. Having what are healthy or helpful ways I can release this. So again, like I talked about in adolescence, for me, it looked like self-harm. And for a lot of autistic people, it looks like self-harm. And that makes sense to me. So having, especially if that's something that's that that you're struggling with, a a listener, like kind of having a toolkit ready to go of alternative ways of releasing um punching bags or yelling or I don't yeah what are some other like what, vigorous walks although that's hard because sometimes depending where you're walking is also a sensory overwhelming place but like physical movement yeah. like intense physical movement what are some besides yelling what are other ways that you found to release the meltdown energy so if I got a soccer ball and she went out to my backyard, I start kicking the soccer ball as hard as I could against the fence. Um, if I did jumping jacks in my living room or like something that really got my heart rate up pretty quickly, uh, that helps a lot as well because you're kind of getting some of that cortisol out, you're getting some of that adrenaline out, the endorphins start going, but it starts to kind of like regulate your system a bit. This is an unpopular opinion with some people. I don't know why, but I love rage rooms. Like I love them so much. There's one I just open near me and I, I go like once a month and I break shit and it is unbelievably cathartic. Um, so I think 
hot showers, those can be helpful for me. So if I like step into like a scalding hot shower, put my hands against the wall and like push against the wall, that can really help ground. Um, if my dogs are not acting, are not the cause of said meltdown, you know, spending time with them, uh, taking them on a walk and just like you said, walking kind of like with pace and intensity can be really helpful too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I love this. I love this. Yeah. Hot showers for me too. That's kind of my go-to is a, like a really hot shower. Um, back when my body would let me like intense, like weightlifting workout sessions, um, with like loud music in my ears. Yeah. Um, yeah. Intensity, right. Like getting the body to match, like if the intensity matches what we're feeling, I think that can help release. Yeah. It's interesting. I thought we'd end up talking about shutdowns more because I know where both of us have a default towards shutdowns, but I do think meltdowns, there's like a specific shame around it. There's a danger to it. Um, so so it, it actually makes sense that we've ended up lingering more on meltdowns. Yeah, for sure. One place I find myself with emotional meltdowns is like someone trying to explain how to do something and I can't figure oh out. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Yes. And like they're, they're explaining it as if it's like the easiest thing in the world. They show you the diagram. They show you like a live demonstration. They ask you to repeat it or you try to repeat it. You can't internally just beat the shit out of yourself and immediately shut down and melt down emotionally. Mm -hmm. That's I'm so glad you said that because that is the other place I'll, I'll get meltdowns and it is interesting. I'll be more likely to melt down than shut down. And it's kind of like a cognitive overload. If someone's explaining something to me and it feels like it should be simple, but it's, it is not simple to me and I'm not tracking and it's frustrating. And I think there's something about like, you're not getting me, you're not getting my frustration that then exactly. like amps it up. Um, but yeah, that's another place where I will have more, not, I wouldn't say a full meltdown, but I'll get like, in my stress in a way that is unique to me um, yeah. when I'm trying to follow directions and they're not making sense, which is like pretty common for me, actually. Pretty common for me too. My spatial awareness and my, or intelligence and ability to follow a diagram, ability to put something together is non-existent. And I get so unbelievably upset. And I think what you just named is exactly it, especially if someone else is involved. It's like, you're not seeing how hard this is for me. And mm -hmm. by no fault of their own, most of the time, it's just like, you don't see it. You don't, you're not understanding how challenging this is. And that is creating this shame dynamic or, or component in it is then creating a meltdown. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Don't ever ask me to go to Ikea. I will melt down. Ikea I literally sure. was just thinking that. I was like, <laughs> you probably don't like Ikea furniture. <laughs> oh, oh God. Yeah. Okay. Let's put it. So, okay, shutdowns. So if meltdowns are like that cortisol fight flight, shutdowns are when we're in that um, kind of dorsal shutdown, um, not necessarily a full on freeze state, but like that freeze mode of the nervous system. Um, and this is what the first time I heard this was Finn Grodden's book. They talk about faux regulation and this idea, this is part of what is so um, kind of disorienting about a shutdown is that it, to other people, you might look really calm, but your your cortisol is still through the roof, through the roof. Um, your stress response is still very active. You still have to release that energy, but you can look calm to the outside observer. And there's been a few like interesting studies out there, but one suggests that autistic people are um, not necessarily more likely to shut down than to melt down, but more likely than like holistic people to respond to stress that way. And so where people around them might have no idea they're stressed, but but actually they're in a stress state in their nervous system. Um, yeah. For people who mask a lot, they tend to be more prone to shutdowns. Because again, if you think about masking, it's about like internalizing, taking in, hiding. And so they tend to cope with more shutdowns, which again is one of the reasons their autism often goes undetected because they're navigating the world through like a disassociated fog 
Um, yeah. yeah. So, and when I'm in shutdown, I feel dissociated. I feel like I'm in a dream. I feel things feel slower. Um, yeah. What about you? Yeah, the exact same. I think I, I feel that way if I had to conservatively guess like 80% of the time in my existence. So I'd feel like you're, and you're kind of like holding it all together if you're masking and like for the outside world, right? So whatever situation you may be in, it may be an unbelievable amount of energy and effort going on behind the scenes, which is then again, why people are so depleted and exhausted in social situations and professional situations, et cetera, um, in high sensory environments. So that's kind of what it is for me too. And I, I feel like my default coping mechanism is escapism, um, which is typically immersing myself in like the same TV shows over and over again. I know I like the same movies that I watched over and over and over again, where I can basically be vacant and not have to be attuned to the world around me. And that's kind of the only way I've found to recharge through this is like that, that type of experience. Mm -hmm. You're saying that's what helps you come out of a shutdown? is repetitive yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah i like because i like the imagery of kind of melting out of a shutdown oh that's weird because there's meltdowns that maybe doesn't work um but it's like a slow right so if in a if in a meltdown you need to like kind of aggressively release energy you you almost need to like warm up a shutdown with a slow yeah, yeah i want to use the word melt it's so like uh, like we well, got a coffee percolation you know it's like mm -hmm just slowly brewing or, or coming back to, I think, instead of releasing mm -hmm. all of that as much as you can or as intensely as you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's a more like gentle. It's really important yeah. to be gentle with the process. Yeah. Yeah. And again, if we're going to circle back to attachment and stuff, I hate where my mic is right now. It's driving me crazy. Um, I, I think in any sort of attuned, healthy attachment, secure attachment place, if you have a partner involved and you're in that place where you are doing what you need to do to kind of come back from that, that shutdown, that acknowledgement without having to have that response or that, I don't know, responsibility. And what I mean by that is if my wife walks into the house and the windows are shut and, the, and it's dark, which it often is, and she's like, oh, you're watching Lord of the Rings or you're watching Game of Thrones. I'm not going to talk to you until you talk to me. That has been really helpful for me because then it feels like I can just, I don't have to exist anywhere except in this form, in this state right here. And I don't have to take on anything else because I don't think I'm capable or able to take on anything else right now. I, I love that. That I like her so much. She just, she knows you so well. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to put any sensory demands on you or like unexpected yeah. Social demands. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's really help. Oh, let's talk about other sensory stuff that can lead to a shutdown. Intense smells that auditory, not auditory, of the word. Olfactory. Well, olfactory sense. Like that for me is the most challenging of all the senses mm -hmm. aside from tactile and like temperature. So if she's cooking, she'll take the air fryer. If she's using the air fryer outside on a porch now, instead of cooking in the house, mm -hmm. because that smell will literally make me shut down to the point where I'm not able to be present anymore because all I can focus on is how uncomfortable I am with mm -hmm. that smell. And it's really challenging to get away from. And I'll smell it on everything. I'll smell it on like my coat. I'll smell it on my sweatshirt on the back of the door. I'll smell it like, like on my blanket in my bed. And I'm like, I can't, I mm -hmm. cannot be, I cannot exist right now. That's so interesting. I haven't thought about like mapping senses to shut down or melt down, but that'd be an interesting thought experiment. I don't like for me, smells, smells are terrible and I'll get headaches and I'll feel nauseated. Um, I'll probably kind of get more anxious. I won't, for me, the, those won't be a shutdown trigger. Um, for me, bodies, like just being in a room. With, so like when you said you were in a kitchen with 25 people, I would be shut down from the start. Like if for I'm sure. in a room of more than I would say four people, then my body's in shutdown mode. Yeah. Um, and sounds, sounds will shut me down so fast. Um, sounds and bodies would be my two like huge shutdown triggers. Bodies are hard for me. 
It's a weird phrase. <laughs> Fatties are hard. Fatties are hard. <laughs> because of the work that I do, especially in these events. So like, I have to now mentally, and I agree with you 100%, I'm in shutdown mode 90% of the time in those. And I am like, because I'm doing four to five a year, I'm like having to anticipate said shutdown, knowing that when I host the, the next event, which is in two weeks here in Asheville, there's 27 people coming. 27 people are going to be in one room in one space a lot. Okay. It's space right now. <laughs> That sounds like so gross to me. Like I'm like <laughs> the face you made to like, <laughs> You made the face of like yeah. disgust. Anyway. Yeah, Is that disgust. it? Disgust. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what I felt. Disgust. Yeah. Like, you were like <laughs> Yeah. So having to mentally prepare and anticipate to be in that environment to absorb that energy, knowing that I'm gonna have to dis disassociate. For the majority of the time and we just did an episode on substances and alcohol and gambling that's where i'm not proud to say it but that is where i will often reach for alcohol is because i'm going to know that i'm going to be immersed in a state where my body is just it can't be present it cannot exist in that room so it's mm -hmm. really hard that's also when i would drink the most was because yeah. shutdowns they're uncomfortable um yeah and so that was because an alcohol like has a way of numbing, but then it's like it's a more pleasant numbing. And so I that was absolutely an alcohol trigger for me was like, I'm not in my body, but it, and it's going back to control, right? Like if I'm not in my body because I'm tipsy, because I'm choosing alcohol versus because I'm shut down and this is out of my, um, yeah, I that was probably one of the biggest alcohol triggers for me was was shutdowns for sure i agree and i think it comes down to like if you're constantly in that shutdown space right where you're not in your body and you're dissociated and you're really struggling to be it's really hard to be still it's hard to be like even if i'm sitting on the couch watching something and i'm in that mode and i'm like so uncomfortable in myself that mm -hmm. it's so hard to just exist mm -hmm. yeah well, similar to meltdowns, I'm curious what you do, like the more helpful things you do to get out of a shutdown. Like for me, I've noticed since, so I can't, this is really interesting, Patrick. I, I've never been able to, I cannot talk about dissociation without dissociating. Like it, just the topic of it will actually, so I've actually been much more shut down since we've switched the topic. So I noticed a few minutes ago, I started gently like swaying back and forth and now I'm swiveling in my chair. And that's one thing talking about that, like kind of slow warm up. I'll start kind of gentle rocking or swaying as a, yeah. as a way to kind of, it helps me from getting like too deep in the shutdown. I think uh, that's one of the things I do to help regulate hot showers. Hot showers are just, they work for everything. Just the um, best, yeah. Except pots. They, they, that kind of sucks about pots is then hot showers can activate other things. Um, but yeah, hot showers, that's a, been a big one. I will do walks more when I'm shut down because um, the the grounding of the movement. Um, and so that's actually my more when I'm, I'm more likely to walk when I'm trying to like move through a shutdown. Um, music, that's when I'll do stim. I'll put on like a stim song. I have this beanbag chair. It's called like the zero gravity. It's a ridiculously expensive beanbag chair, but it's amazing. It like um, supposedly like mimics zero gravity so i'll lay in it i'll put a weighted blanket on me and i'll put my stem song on so pressure weight repetition yeah, yeah repetition that's what you said too but those yeah. are the things i'll go to um yeah after a after a shutdown and i think the big differentiation differentiation here right comparatively to meltdown is the intensity it is like mm -hmm. you're not looking for the intensity you're not looking to get the intensity out it's about soothing. It's about sensory soothing. It's about like slow and gentle, like, um, introduction. And I agree mm -hmm. with walking. It's just kind of like getting back into your body, like just noticing the weight on your feet, just noticing the way that your feet feel against the ground, like just noticing the temperature that it is outside. Um, I'm petting my dog with my left arm, by the way. So like that is also one of those things where like, so just 
you know, petting your animal or hugging your animal. Um, so that helps me, um, hot showers. Yeah. That's, that's my go-to for almost everything, regardless of what mood I'm in. Um, I'd say also just, yeah, repetition. Um, uh, my, I have like a weighted sloth stuffed animal thing that my friend Tara got me. So I'll use that. Um, I need it to Is be it a wormy? Be dark. I don't know. I don't think it is. I just got a wormy. And it, so it's like a weighted stuffy, but you can also put it in the microwave? Uh, no, it is not. Okay. So I just found these. These I think would be great. Uh, yeah. Especially for meltdown recovery. Wormies or yeah, a stuffed, like just weight. But I love that yeah. you have a stuffed sloth. That's perfect. Then when I buy it, send it to her. I'll like, buy those. And the therapist says I should, but I'm an adult man. Like, I don't want this stuffed animal sloth. All of a sudden, it shows up at my house a week later. I'm like, can you find so buy this sweet. for me? And she's like, yeah, you need it, and you you should have it. So, in a child reparenting, also helpful for some of this stuff. Um, but yeah, I think these are good strategies. These are all the ones that I do. I can't think of anything that I'm doing differently. I do think. Just vocalizing it sometimes if you can to, mm -hmm. if you have a partner at home or a friend or a roommate or whoever, just like, just making it known, like, this is the space that I'm in can be helpful because again, having that person reciprocate with, I'm just not going to talk to you for an hour or I'm going to just like not expect anything of you for an hour can be really freeing and helpful too. So. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. The other thing I'm thinking of is, um, for me, I know loops, like loops are that you can put them in your ear. They're pretty discreet and they take sound down by like 15 decimals. Yeah. Um, whenever I'm going into a group context, I typically wear loops and I know that my threshold is a lot, like I have a much larger capacity, um, before I shut down. And so that's been one accommodation that's been helpful for me is is using like using sensory blockers. And that's where I'm really intrigued with your idea of like smell as a trigger for shutdown. Like, I, I don't know if there's any science to that, but I'd be so intrigued about it in the exercise of mapping your sensory triggers to like, if one is more likely to flip different states. And so if you know you're like gonna go into a noisy environment or a bright environment, thinking through like what accommodations ahead of time will expand your capacity. And this is where like, good tactile sensory and fidget toys come into play too and i know so many people have similar responses like i'm an adult i don't want to bring a fidget toy out in public i challenge you to think differently about that like if you can put a rock in your pocket or something with a different texture or edge that you can just touch or something small that you can just be playing with can really be helpful too and i have those things all over the place like i'm um, constantly going from one to the other based on like texture and temperature and other things. So it's just occurring to me, like how many sense, how much sensory regulation you and I have both been using throughout this whole conversation. That's not going to be visible to most people. Like I have a weighted blanket on my lap. I have a swivel chair. I have a like puffy thing with a, with a lot of texture that my feet are on and I keep like grabbing onto it for texture. I have a poppet. Um, you have a dog next to you that you're petting. You've had fidgets. Like there's so many sensory things that we've been doing this whole hour. Um, it's just interesting to to realize that, think on that. It's It's been kind of strange to reflect on that, saying like now I understand the things that I need for accommodation versus 34-ish years of not knowing or not having good awareness and not doing these things and how much more challenging that life was. One thing I'll say with everything we're talking about, because a lot of you have DM'd me um, about this because, you know, I travel a lot. How do you navigate this while traveling? And it is very, very challenging. I, I just want to be transparent. And that's where I would bring the weighted blanket with you in your backpack or your bag or a weighted pillow or the weighted stuffed animal or the fidget toys. Because if you want to talk about sensory hell, the airport and the airplane is kind of the epitome um, because it's, you know, the odors, the sounds, the smells, the bodies, like, it's just, it's a lot. So I actually witnessed my dad have a major meltdown in the middle of the Madrid airport. Cause he does not, he did not know he was autistic at the time until I told him 
like I told you about this story, but he lost his wallet on the plane. And it was right as we got to Spain and literally meltdown in the airport, like hitting himself in the head and calling himself stupid and all the things I had to like help him soothe and ground and regulate. And those environments can feel really overwhelming for people because when we talk about control, talk about any complete lack of control, when stuff like that happens to you unexpectedly in environments that are in the public. So really, really hard to experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Why did I just diverge there? I don't know. Uh, All I know is- sensory. I mean, sensory shutdowns, meltdowns. Like it's all, it's all fair game. Yeah. So you know, this where I, that was my little like entrance way to be like, hey, here are things you can do to support your sensory system. This is why these things keep happening to you in these types of environments. Like. Mm-hmm. I think the more education we can provide to you and the more more resources mm-hmm. we can provide, the better. Totally. I kind of feel like a broken record at this point because I feel like I talk about sensory regulation all the time. Um, but in this, so self-care for autistic people is releasing in March, which probably be shortly around this time that this yeah. is released. We could tie that one in for that reason. Yeah. But I like with, so the way it's the structure of the book is like a, like 100 tips, self-care tips. But I was with the editor and the publisher, I was like, okay, but we need like a more robust chapter on sensory self-care because this is the bedrock of self-care for autistic people. And this is often what gets missed. So the first chapter is all on sensory um, self-care. And honestly, I was so limited in my words. I wish I could have said so much more, but the important part, I'm not... I'm not trying to plug the book. <laughs> it feels like it sounds like I am. What I'm trying to say is in my brain process, I was like, we have to start talking, like any conversation on self-care has to start with the sensory. Because if we start talking about these other like higher level things and we're trying to put that on top of a dysregulated sensory system, like it's just, it's not going to stick. It's not going to do anything. Yeah. yeah, it's like throwing gasoline on fire. So and plug your book. I mean, hell, this is... Uh, this that feels... I'm, I'm bad at that stuff, Patrick. <laughs> I'll plug in that. promo. I know. I know. I know. You worked really hard on it, though. It's going to help a lot of people. So that book will be a release of this episode because it's going to come out around that time. Make sure you get it. Um, but I agree. It's the foundation. And if you don't have the foundation taken care of or at least attended to um, and, and don't have the awareness around it, it becomes so much more challenging because then it becomes a situation where either you, your therapist, your friends, your colleagues, your doctor, whoever is like, have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have you tried this? And you're like, I'm so dysregulated that I can't try any of that. So mm-hmm. I'm really glad you named that and how that may lead to a part two of the book that you're creating. Um, that's actually in the works. I know you too well. <laughs> you do. You do. Yeah. No, but sensory self-care. Yeah, I think that is just such an important important part of wellness for for us. Um, and, and for ADHDers too. You know, like I know we often sure. focus on the autistic, but ADHDers often have a lot of sensory stuff going on as well. Um, totally. Yeah. I feel like we're in the wrap-up zone. Yeah, I think so. I think we're in sync today. Um, it's weird when I haven't seen you in weeks. But I think this episode was great and I'm glad we had it because I think we could have spin off of this, honestly, like mm-hmm. such an important topic, sensory systems in general and, and all the ways that things show up. So, um, yeah, I think we're done. I think my voice is getting out too, which I'm noticing. So I think we're really done. And to everyone listening, new episodes are out every and Friday, all major platforms like YouTube, buy an egg in the book. It's going to help you quite a bit. And what is it called? Self-care for autistics by Dr. Uh, self-care F. for autistic people. Mm-hmm. Perfect. And we will link that uh, when it's available because you've worked really hard on it and it deserves to be celebrated. All right, everyone. Megan's going to feel awkward now. Uh, I, I am. Having the eternal grossed out expression of me being so, sort of 25 human beings. <laughs> I, I'm going to say this though, because like, it is a promo, but it's also like, it's so relevant for this. And I yeah, think it can help people. Exactly. I'm doing uh, for my people on my newsletter, but I'll, I'll extend it for my podcast. 
I'm doing a special promotion where if you pre-order the book, you'll get a free neurodivergent insights workbook. And I have a workbook on sensory regulation. So if you're like resonating with this, and if you want to go buy self-care for autistic people, you do that so that you get the sensory regulation book for free or any other workbook. Um, so basically you'll get a coupon code to download that for free if you pre-order self-care. Um, and I can put details on that promotion in the notes. Sounds good. All right, everyone. We will talk to you in some way in the next week. So thanks for listening. I hope this was helpful and goodbye. As you may know from listening to our podcast, I've been working on a book, Self-Care for Autistic People, and I'm excited to announce it's out this month, both in physical form and as an audiobook. As a celebration of its release, I'd like to share some excerpts from the audiobook edition with you, our podcast listeners. The book is designed as a book you can pick up for brief, easy five-minute reads with over 100 different entries that introduce you to practices for incorporating self-care. You can find the audiobook wherever audiobooks are sold, available on March 19th. Enjoy. Whether you mask or not, it's important to learn how to take care of yourself in ways that actually reward and nourish your brain, instead of using self-care ideas that are created from a neurotypical lens. That's why the tips, ideas, and information in self-care for autistic people are tailored specifically to address sensory, emotional, relational, and professional challenges so you can feel more aligned with who you are and build a grounded and expansive life. Self-care for autistic people includes information on how to work with your sensory and nervous systems, find practices to help you self-advocate, and discover ways to limit burnout. Starting a self-care practice may seem overwhelming, so take your time and focus on the chapters that resonate with you. You can also start by implementing a few practices at a time. And now here's another excerpt from the audiobook edition of Self-Care for Autistic People that touches on one of my favorite subjects, sensory detox. When I worked in hospitals and universities, I would invariably return home each night shrouded in palpable fatigue and plagued by a persistent, low-grade fever. It was a puzzling malaise that seemed to persist without a discernible cause. My revelation came when I realized I was experiencing sensory overload to such a degree that my body was interpreting it as a physical illness. My autistic child and I now refer to these as sensory sick moments, when we feel the wear and tear of a high sensory day. Once the onset of sensory sickness begins to creep in, I know it's time to initiate my sensory detox routine, a series of calming and restorative activities designed to rebalance my sensory system. This might involve taking a hot shower to cleanse and refresh, changing into my most comfortable clothes, or sinking into a beanbag chair cloaked in a weighted blanket while indulging in the rhythm of my favorite stim song. I might also turn to my trusty TENS unit for relief. TENS units, short for Transcutaneous Electrical Nerve Stimulation Units, are these handy devices that provide many electrical zaps or pulses. While they are predominantly used for pain, they also work to provide repetitive sensory input. When I engage in these rituals, I can feel the harsh sensory residue of the day gradually dissolve. Your sensory detox will be as unique as your sensory profile. While I find solace in stillness and weighted comfort, you might prefer an energetic walk or music. Explore and identify what suits you. Then curate your sensory detox ritual, a haven for those intense, high sensory days when sensory sickness looms.